What is up, everybody? It is Alex from Heavy New York calling from Zoom again, and this time we are here with Before the Dawn. Tomas, it is great to see you for like the seventh or eighth time, and Pavo, it's great Happy to meet now. you. Yeah, exciting times. times. Yeah. yeah, exciting times. Yeah, very exciting. This is the, like, like I said already, this is the first interview we are doing with Pavo, so it's... Uh... <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Exciting times. Yeah, exciting very, times. very exciting times. Pavo, you could see all the torture that I've been putting Tomas through since, uh, what, the first Wolfheart <laughs> tour in uh, 2018. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> But it's so awesome to have you here. The first new Before the Dawn album, Stormbringers. I had the privilege of hearing this album early, and it is absolutely awesome. For people who haven't heard the full album yet, though, do you feel that the first single that we heard so far, Destroyers, is a good representation of what this whole record is going to sound like? Or is that just scratching the surface of what's to come? Who wants to go first? Definitely scratching the surface. I don't think any like a particular song from the album would underline the whole album so every song itself is just a crash a scratch on the surface you need to hear the album as a full because i think it's so diverse with the vocals and the songwriting that none of the songs alone could stand uh, for the whole album mm -hmm. uh, would you like to add anything pavo yeah yeah tom uh thomas said it so it's only like a uh scratching the surface there's a lot of things happening in the album and and yeah it's just the first taste of the album yeah and this is your first edition with uh before the dawn as well i believe right so coming into yeah. before the dawn were you kind of looking at the earlier material being like this is how i have to play or were you kind of given a little bit of your own mix, uh chance to bring your own mix into before the dawn well kind of both because um I've been listening to the band since I was, since I was a teenager. Uh, and uh, like when I started to le really learn how to sing uh, and do growling and everything. And uh, so I was listening to Before the Dawn and kind of like learning through them. So uh, of course there is elements in my singing uh, like already from Before the Dawn, but uh, also I like to add my own things because yeah uh I, I like to like use my voice as diverse as i can and uh, just whatever i can do i want to do it and uh but yeah of course i want to like uh, honor the legacy and like keep it before the dawn <laughs> This is the first Before the Dawn album interview in 11 years since Rise of the Phoenix. Uh, so it's been quite a while now. Um, but it, was there sort of like a preconceived vision of the making of this album? Was the intention to just pick up where you left off after Rise of the Phoenix? Or was this meant to sort of signify like a new beginning uh, for Before the Dawn with Pavo coming on board and everything like that? Definitely a new beginning. It's, uh, it's 12 years since I wrote Rise of the Phoenix and... I've done seven albums for Wolfheart, two albums for, for Dawn of Solace and something else in the between. So to me, it's it would be impossible to continue where we left because it's, yeah. Baba used the word legacy. That's how old I am as a songwriter. <laughs> so it's, uh, I, I wouldn't even want to try to pick up where we left. It was the whole idea of the comeback was to like uh, start from start as a new even though we wanted to sound like before the dawn but we didn't want to look too much back in, in the catalog and try to figure out how we want to sound and do we need to like uh because there's also this is the fourth version of the band it's not like uh depend well like which era are you looking at from the before the dawn is just like a different vocalist different styles so wolfheart basically continued from rise of the phoenix and uh now before the dawn continues from the Death Star Rising. That's how I actually see the whole thing, musically. Yeah. Um, when it came to uh, this idea as well, because um, you mentioned, uh, Tomas, I mean, with so many, this year marks 10 years since the debut of Wolfheart, in a way, and you've put out so many albums uh, between that, and with all the projects you've been involved with, my nickname for you has actually been the Finnish Dr. Dre because of just how many projects <laughs> and how many projects you were involved with um conceptually speaking because wolfheart's music always told stories in a way especially i thought that was very prevalent on king of the north as well 
are you continuing is there a similar storyline or maybe a similar conceptual element that's demonstrated with before the dawn or because i feel like with you know soundscape of silence or the ghost or 4 17 a.m they all have to stand out in a way so is before the before the dawn or uh, before the dawn is that a little bit more diverse in its uh lyrical concepts yeah it doesn't have a similar kind of like a very narrow concept that i like to use in wolfheart like uh, with the uh, one album about the winter war that is only three months in finnish history or or the mythology with the with the latest uh, king of the north uh it's a lot more diverse it's more personal also but it's a lot more diverse mm -hmm. and uh, i uh, yeah yep. and pavo uh coming into the band as well because this is your first uh album with the band but when you you know you're gonna have to perform some rise of the phoenix and death star rising songs and all that is that music gonna resonate with you a little bit differently than the stuff you're singing on with stormbringers um well um uh kind of yeah uh the uh like the um, older albums uh i have listened to for many years now and the uh, the music is uh i I've, I've loved the band always like I, I i really that's my thing like my stuff i really like this kind of music already so uh there are like things that i uh, listen to uh reg regularly anyways so they're like um yeah, it doesn't um yeah i can i can like um yeah, it's just my my thing, and I I love to listen to them, and I also love to sing them, and uh, I can't wait to perform them also with the band. And uh, well, the songs that I have uh, co-written with the band, uh, they are also really precious to me, but like in a different way. But they are all like precious, anyways. Yeah. And I kind of wanted to discuss uh, all of your projects versus uh, Before the Dawn. I'll start with you, um, Pavo, because you also, uh, th uh, last year, released Dead Hymns with uh, your band uh, Kusuo, Kusuo, if I pronounce that correctly. How different of a mindset are you with uh, Before the Dawn as opposed to this project with writing uh, Dead Hymns? Um, well, um, yeah, uh, Kusuo is uh, black metal and i'm the guitarist in that band and uh it's um uh it it was uh, originally a one-man band and uh then he just hired more people uh that like uh we had a idea that in the future we are doing live shows and stuff uh, but uh, i've also been involved with the writing process and all that stuff but um like melodic death metal is more my thing and it's it's really my my jam and uh black metal is just i i, I really like to play guitar but i'm not i'm not the like the most amazing guitarist so uh i just like to do different things because i i'm into a lot of different music so uh so it's completely different and uh, of course, like my main instrument is the singing, so uh, I can use it much more diverse, and uh, I I kind of put a, a lot more thought into that. Mm. Um, and with Tomas, because uh, with you know all the times I've interviewed you about Wolfheart, we talked about the Winter War and all these different like you know uh, individuals involved and stuff. Like I've always thought Wolfheart's music was very historical. Like I thought like. Uh, you know your whole discography is a history lesson in a way would you say that before the dawn is a little bit more on a personal level in a way and would you're kind of like looking inward for this project a little bit more yeah yeah when it comes to lyrics that's uh, pretty much spot on uh music wise is uh before the dawn from the very beginning has been basically just a reflection of uh, like life force and everything that is fun about playing metal which is kind of like a big contrast to the lyrics which are not not anything like a, there's nothing funny or nothing fun or enjoyable in the lyrics but the music itself is every song is basically written 
uh, you know, in, with that perspective, that it's going to be fun to play live. It's going to be fun to play with the guys. It's going to be fun to play with the guitar or the drums or whatever who is playing in the band. And uh, it, it carries such a big positive energy that doesn't relate on the lyrics at all. But it's, uh, that also differs uh, uh, before the dawn from Wolfhard quite greatly. Because from, in, in Wolfhard, I write the songs to bug up the stories in the lyrics. So it's a, kind of like a movie soundtrack for the story that is in the lyrics. In, in Before the Dawn, is is completely different. Yeah. I also consider Before the Dawn, this is for lack of better words in a way, to be a little bit more experimental. Like, yes, there's the melodic death metal aspects in it. But, like, I've heard, you know, some people see elements of metalcore in Before the Dawn. Some people see elements of black metal in Before the Dawn. It almost seems like it's able to kind of go all along the spectrum in a way. Is there maybe for lack of better words, less rules with Before the Dawn? Is there more room to bring in different elements? There's no rules. I think that is the... What sounds good for the song sounds good for the song. Like, it doesn't... The, like, of course, I wouldn't, like, uh, experiment too far from the different styles of metal. I want to make good metal songs. But uh, what, what goes in, like, uh, for the arrangement inside the song there is very little rules and it's, it's sometimes i don't see it that diverse myself mm. but of course i don't analyze myself when i write music i just what sounds good sounds good i i don't stop to think sh what should it sound or what i'm wh what are the pieces of the puzzle of the, on the table i just if it sounds good then the song is done and, and i don't need to think about it more but what i get a lot from the reviews and the reporters is the amount of elements which always surprises me i i don't hear metalcore i don't hear certain elements that uh that a lot of people pick up from the music but i think that's just a good thing yeah well, well what i see very simple and straightforward actually like includes a lot of like different elements that i don't put there in purpose yeah well i think also maybe with the jesse leach collaboration recently that maybe uh that there's uh yeah. You're you're gonna get you're now gonna be looked at as the metalcore artist. You're gonna have as many people thinking you're from Massachusetts as you are from uh, Finland now. So <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, one question I have for both of you is: being that you're both guitarists and vocalists at the same time, do you express similar sides of yourself as both a vocalist and a guitarist, or does the instrument express different sides of who you are? Like, can you express yourself with the guitar in a way that you couldn't vocally, and vice versa? Well, I, I don't I don't do any clean vocals. So guitar or piano, whatever is is what I use to bring the melodies. So it's a huge contrast. To me, vocals it's just growling, which makes it basically a percussion. It, to me, it's just a, a like an outlet of aggression and uh, rhythmical arrangements. And guitar is what brings all the melodies and then the actual music. So. To me, it's it's completely two different things. Yeah. How about you, Pavel? Um, well, um, uh, as I said, I'm not that like uh, the most amazing guitar player, but uh, uh, I I like to play with the feeling, and uh, I, I really like the melodies and all, all that stuff. And uh, with my other projects, I always <clears throat> write songs with guitar, and uh, it starts with that, and. Um, yeah, uh, but in uh, I'm I'm not playing them sim simultaneously in any any of the projects. But uh, of course, when I play guitar with, for example, in Kuusuo, uh, then I'm gonna be a totally different character because I have a like a alter ego in that thing, and so it's gonna be completely different kind of thing. But um, but. Uh, yeah, with vocals, I I feel like I can express myself a lot better. Mm -hmm. Now, this is one hell of a year for Before the Dawn to come back because this year does mark 20 years uh, since the debut uh, album of Before the Dawn with My Darkness. I know that we had the Gehenna EP uh, before that, but taking me back to the debut of Before the Dawn, what was the sort of memory behind the making of that album and what concepts and lyrical ideas are sort of explored on that album in a way it's 20 years ago yeah come on <laughs> uh it's um 
I, I mainly remember the excitements. It was the first full length album we, we were doing at that point. I was again, 20, like two decades younger. So it is the, the amount of excitement is, is what I remember, remember the most. Uh, I, I wouldn't say that we knew what we were doing because it, it was the first album and, um, but yeah, I, I, there's only like positive memories, but I, I can't analyze that deep because yeah, I was a teenager then and I'm a middle-aged man now, so <laughs> a lot of water under the bridge from, uh, from that session, but, uh, but it's, it's really good albums to me still. Uh, and we are gonna play several songs from that album, uh, this year on the, on the tours, not because of it's 20 years, it's simply coincidence, but, um, but yeah, it's, it's still a good album and still a really like fun songs to play. But I I hardly remember anything serious about that session anymore. Yeah, you were you were in your twenties. I was ten years old when that album came out. So uh, <laughs> yeah, or, or or no, it came out I think in the winter of twenty two. So I was nine. I wasn't even in double digits when that album came out yet. So <laughs> yeah, but that yeah. album. When I mean, when you enter that album with Unbreakable and you, you know, you bring out songs like Take My Pain or Alone or Human Hatred, I mean, that is just such a concoction of emotion on there. But next year also marks uh, 20 years of 417 AM. And I'm just wondering what the sort of significance was behind that particular time in a way. Uh, yeah, it's uh, it's kind of like this ongoing story. It's been, we've been adding one minute in the, in few songs later on so i think we are now like uh, next one is going to be 420. there was uh, the last song of my darkness was 4 16 a.m mm -hmm. so that's why the second album is, is like uh, one minute from that ending of the album it's uh it's, it's connected with the band name also that's the it, like uh, if i'm able to have a sleeping pattern that I work all the nights and I, I go to bed in the morning. That's my favorite time between three o'clock and five o'clock a.m. Mm -hmm. Like I want to be awake when the when I see the sunrise and then I go to bed. But I, I'm the most efficient writer during the night time. Wow. So that's 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 my favorite time to create. Mm -hmm. And every time it's one minute later when I pick like I bring up the theme, but um. It was supposed to be in the in the second music video, like at this this time kind of thing. But uh, I, I I wasn't able to put the storyline in the way that I wanted. But uh, how, but yeah, I've been carrying this time theme for nineteen years now. Well, well, how come we didn't get four eighteen a.m. in the ghost? There's uh, I don't remember anymore which album, but that's I think that is in the lyrics of the EP that we did. That is called like a decade of darkness mm. okay so, so it, it, it's not always in the song titles i think two, two times i've handled that in the song lyrics so it's kind of like a hidden thing going on there you need to be very very like a, like a, you need to like uh, pay attention to pick up the whole thing musical easter eggs as i like to say <laughs> yeah that's a good yeah, yeah. Uh, exactly, this, yeah. this question could apply to both of you guys as songwriters and lyricists when darkness and pain and agony because you know when I listened to you know the the element to my darkness and when I listened to you know songs like take my pain and you know uh, the title track of my darkness and alone you know that's a very emotional a very very emotional album but even with the new album Storebringers with songs like destroyer or reveries or chains or divided those also too have a very emotional element behind those tracks when you have to when darkness and agony and pain is the source of your inspiration does that make the creative process just as deteriorating as it can can be cathartic in a way this is this is why i like the interviews with you because it's uh, you never get like one sentence questions i've been doing already a few emailers that are just basically telling me something about the band name, introduce the band, introduce the album. But uh, yeah. Oh, thank you. It's, it, but also the, those are big questions to come up with uh, with the, like a proper answer. But it's, um, I've been writing songs so long. I've already like uh, released over 200 songs. 
So like 15 years ago already, it became like this uh, ongoing pattern. When I stopped analyzing and w whenever I felt the need, I just wrote what, what I felt inside into the lyrics and the song. So to me, it's, it's actually quite difficult to explain or analyze the whole process because some people write diaries, some people uh, go to see a therapist or something. I write songs. And it's like a, it became like a like a steady pattern was so long ago already. Like I was doing that before I started before the dawn. So as long as I can remember, I've been just like a pouring whatever I have inside to the songs. So it's it's part of my like uh, my life. Hmm. I, I don't know how to like put it into smaller pieces or, or like analyze. I don't know anything about catharsis or anything like that. That's how I learned to process stuff when I was 15 or so. And, and Pavo, how, how about you? Because even not only with Stormbringers, but some of the emotional elements on Dead Hymns as well, too, has like, you know, a great way of using darkness as the fuel to your fire. Has the songwriting process and the lyrical process been just as, you know, deteriorating or self-destructive as it can, can be cathartic as well? <laughs> well, I kind of have a similar uh, answer than Thomas had, because I also have this way of uh, handling things uh, through writing music. And uh, it has always been like that. Uh, and uh, I, I feel like uh, I get it. Uh, it's it's just like some sort of therapy to just uh, get, get the melodies or get the um, sad lyrics or whatever it is. Uh, the the song itself like together and then when you when you're finished with with it uh well you you can go on with your life again and like yeah it's the same kind of thing like putting all the uh sadness and <laughs> uh, all these negative things in the music and make something beautiful out of it yeah and depending oh, on oh, oh one thing i need to add now that now that i was actually thinking the whole thing well, listening to Pavo is uh, only only like um, only time when I kind of like feel that there's a process going on is when the song is ready. When I when I listen to the song, the song writing itself, it doesn't matter how uh, difficult the the stuff in the lyrics are to me personally. It doesn't feel difficult until the song is ready, and then listening to the song can be like. A, more complicated thing is certain songs I would, would never play live because of the same reason. But the writing of the songs and the lyrics, that that's just like a inhale, exhale. It's just, you know, breathing. But uh, but when the song is ready, then it can unlock certain things that I, I, I don't want to process anymore. And but then it, I don't I don't need to, but the, the song has done its purpose for me and in some cases, I just choose not to play the songs live. Well, in addition, though, darkness is prevalent through your whole catalog. Like the debut of Before the Dawn is My Darkness. The debut of <laughs> Dawn of Solace is The Darkness. So in addition to exploring like Finnish history and different wars and stuff, or really just depending on the subject matter, I wasn't sure if maybe The Darkness and Dawn of Solace is almost kind of like an external form of darkness. It could be the darkness of man and humanity, whereas my darkness is personal. But depending on the subject matter that both of you sing about, can it resonate with you in a different way? Or is it almost a creative process depending, or a different energy depending on what the song could be about? Can you sum up the question a little yeah. bit more simple? Yeah, of course. Sorry, I, I got I got very into the zone. Depend, <laughs> depending on what the song is about, does it resonate with you in yeah. a different way? Or are you channeling a different energy into it if it's coming from an internal source or an external source? Ah, okay. Well, every song is, is always individual. So I like, even though the lyrics or the titles or even the visual side with the videos or the graphics can have a lot of similarities and even the same terms have a different meaning when it's in a different song like i i, I have certain patterns with the lyrics that i use i have certain favorites like words and phrases that i use but they mean different things in different song and of course it's like uh 
when the, when the same words have a different meaning, it, of course, the, it resonates differently. So my darkness can be so many different darknesses. It can be like the sadness that you have or what I choose to believe that there is no God and we, we carry the darkness and, and the, the light, which are like the good and evil inside each, each individually. That can be the darkness also, which is completely different than sadness. That's the, that's the, that's the murderer and, and, and bad, everything bad that is like uh, inside us. So it's, hmm. each, each word can be seen differently. And every song basically like uh, boosts the uh, word and the meanings in a, in a different light. Mm -hmm. I, I think when you release like your greatest hits of your entire, when you release the, the essential discography of Tomas, it'll be called 50 Shades of Darkness. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, that, yeah that would be cool that would be really good i need to remember that yeah, <laughs> yeah. um and uh, uh pavo this was actually one of the first questions i asked tomas when i first interviewed him back in 2018 this is like about your lyrical process have you ever had lyrics already written and that maybe helped determine the music for any project that you're in or do you need music before you could really think of any lyrical ideas uh to me it's always the way that I need the music uh, uh, and uh, I don't need the whole song ready or anything but just that I get the, um, uh, the feel of the melody and uh, stuff then I can uh, build the lyrics around it but I, I need some music to back it up of course I have some some songs uh, that are that all lyrics that I have written already uh, but it feels kind of uh, with other projects that I've done. Uh, it feels more connected to the song if I hear the m music first and then I build the lyrics around it. Mm -hmm. Now, whenever I ask somebody how the making of an album was and they tell me, oh, we all mutually came together and it was all collaborative and all, I don't believe it because if you're in a band with four to five other people, you're writing a dozen or so songs, there's gonna be disagreement, you're all gonna have your own emotions and your own individual experiences. So when it came to the making of this album, did all of you need to be kind of on the same page emotionally with the making of Stormbringers, or were you all kind of bringing in your different worlds and different experiences and kind of letting them collide and that maybe helped add contrast and diversity to the album? Hmm. Well, um, uh, the, my songwriting process goes the similar way with uh, every band that I have. It's, uh, I, I basically write the whole song ready. And then what, what the other members hear is pretty much a range song with the drums and the bass and the guitars. Of course, I never tell anybody what to play. If they Whatever they want to add and they feel like would make the song better, it's I'm just with open arms but uh when it comes to the instruments and the, and the basic like the music itself it's just i i, I just write everything ready but when it comes to the vocals like uh like i said i don't do clean vocals so i'm not gonna tell a vocalist how to do their job so that's that's where i just hand over the song and and i i just wanted to hear every idea that pablo had for the vocals and we started building from there but uh if there's this uh only collision that there can be is in my head because uh, I don't really like uh, it's not that I don't let anybody to participate but I don't just get random ideas like every melody leads to a song like it's just how my head works I build a song around the first idea that I get I, I like it dead song is a good example the writing of that song took less than the song is long hmm. Well, it took me two minutes. Right, it took me two minutes to write the song, and it's four minutes length. And that's that's how, the one idea is like a spark, and then I have the drum, then I have the bass, then I have the next verse, then I think, then I have the chorus, then I think about the C part, and then I have the strings going on top of the of the guitars, and then I decide in my head that which is going to be the lead element, and it's going to be a guitar, and then I then I have the song, and then I do a demo recording of the whole song. So there's. Uh, it not just there's no space, but there's no time for collision. Mm -hmm. Because it's just, the song's just like, 
Mm-hmm. Well, with the with those sparks, I've talked about this before. I can't remember if I asked this in our previous interviews or not. But when the spark comes, and you know, Rome wasn't built in one day. So like, when it comes to when you're working on a song for a long period of time, based on that spark, th- does it get harder and harder to capture that moment or maintain that spark when you work on something for a long period of time? Well, uh, that's the thing. I don't work long with songs. Of course, I, I work long with an album. Like there's a, when the when the song is written, then it has to be demo recorded. Then there's pre-production. Then a rehearsal. Then then we do the recordings. Then we do the mixing. So it's a, of course it's a long process from one song to be part of an album. Like from the idea to be part of the album. But the writing of the song, I don't spend time. And I basically write every song on the spot and then we just work the different like layers of production on top of the song. But I, it's not like a, the, that much of a composing, only with the vocals. But uh, yeah. Well, also, Pavo, because, you know, your lyrics and your vocals have a great essence of emotion that's demonstrated onto the album as well. So do you almost need to kind of put yourself in a similar emotional headspace? It's one thing to hear the music, but like, do you need to kind of almost seek out the inspiration or almost get yourself in in an emotional headspace or be in a specific spot to think of vocal ideas in a way? Or do you just kind of go right into it? Mm -hmm. Uh, I have different ways to do it. Uh, I I like to change it a bit. It's never like the same same pattern, but uh, at times when I, for example, uh, c- created uh, like song melodies uh, for this album, uh, a couple of songs just, uh, I-, I listened to the demo once and then I was like, okay, I know how it goes uh, immediately. And some some songs were like, I had to listen to them for tens of times, uh, a lot of times. and. Uh, uh, and then like build it uh, piece by piece, and um, and then then when when it got to the recording, uh, yeah, uh, I don't know. I, I have this kind of a uh, I can click myself into that uh, like um, in the in this mood uh, that I can perform as as much feeling to the song as I can. Uh, so it. it it hasn't been that much of an issue ever to do like a, uh, a more feeling to the song. Uh, I I feel I feel the music and I I really love the uh, always the contrast of beautiful and harsh, uh, and it resonates with me. Mm-hmm. So it's easy to get to that mood. And the final question I have, and this could apply, uh, you both can answer this one too, is that when you are playing the song live and people are interpreting it in their own way, like I'll, I'll, uh, I'll just confess, uh, Tomas, when I listened to King of the North, which I consider to be, by the way, the best Wolf Heart album, I think you really hit the nail on the head, uh, uh, late, uh, as you explored more. So I, excellent work on that. But the music, like, while I do focus on the story and I'm interested in it melodically, it just represents, a real personal aspect in my life and I think you know a lot of other people resonate with your music in their own way specifically and uh, for so for both of you when people interpret your music and they have their own experience with it does that add another layer of context or add another layer of meaning to the music that wasn't there before you put it out a meaning yes uh, so when I write music I don't there's it's never like a, there's never a purpose that it needs to like reach other people it's very like uh i mean in my very selfish bubble when i write music it just serve serves the purpose for myself but of course of course it, it's it's uh when people come to talk to me after the shows or i get uh, feedback from the album not just that people are saying that the song the song is good or the album is good but there's some connection with their lives or there's been some hardship in their lives and it, it played a big role that of course adds completely another like uh, layer of uh, meaning for them not just the songs but the music writing and you realize that it's it's a lot more than just your own bubble that you are working in and because otherwise like 
you write the write the album then then you you get the album out then you go on tour you basically stay very closely inside your bubble still at least that's how i see it when i go to play live i don't particularly enjoy being in front of the audience and it's uh i i do it for myself still so it always surprises me and i never like take it that for granted when people actually give me feedback that the music itself plays a big role it's not just an entertainment which makes the whole thing more important to me also because that's the i feel very less as an entertainer i don't like that as aspect of in uh, in the music business at all i don't i don't entertain i have my reasons to write music and i enjoy playing the music but i don't do it so that i would entertain people or be in the spotlight myself but it's a completely different thing when people come to talk to me and uh, they tell me that the music itself matters in, a, in a, like a deeper level. Well, I got to say, on the recent uh, Flesh God Obscura tour when you were uh, playing, and uh, I was laughing so hard. I was watching you from the seats. And uh, when you asked the security guard on stage, uh, is there rules against moshing here? I love you guys in New York City, but you got the worst pit of the tour so far. I was just like, that was awesome. So, you... you <laughs> You 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 uh you you have the entertainment aspect. I know that's not the main goal, but I think you bring it without you realizing it. I, I can do it when it needs to be done. Let's put it this way. But I always do one speech in a show, yeah. and I let let Lauri or Magellis handle the whole other stuff. But I, I'm very good at like uh, uh, being annoying to the audience and, and telling they suck at the mosh pit. That's yeah. that's my like. Uh, that's my specialty. <laughs> You're provoking a riot. And uh, Pop yeah. and Pavo, did you want to add anything too, like about the interpretation of your lyrics and if that could add another layer of meaning as well? Uh, yeah, well, uh, I, I think that's just like the, uh, the real power of music that it uh, uh, resonates with people a different way and you get different uh, interpretation of the songs and uh all, all the feed that, f feedback uh, that i've heard heard and received about like uh, that songs have touched people in different ways and uh, that it's important to them and uh, stuff I, I love to hear that and it's it's really great thing and yeah it, it feels like i'm doing something right so yeah, it's awesome. it's it's a great thing it's awesome so before we go, I want to thank you both so much for your time, for such an awesome conversation. It's an honor to be the first Before the Dawn interview. Uh, this will be uploaded uh, probably like later in June, um, as per requested. Uh, but uh, is there just anything else you would all like to promote with Before the Dawn or with Wolfheart or Dawn of Solace or with Cusio or Defiled Serenity or any other project that you're all involved with? Uh, what I want to say that I, I'm already counting days to bring Before the Dawn to North America. We never played a single show in North America. So this, now it, it has to happen. Yeah, it needs to. It needs to. Yeah. Anything you'd like to add, Baba? Uh, yeah, well, I just I just hope that um, uh, people listen to uh, our music and come to the shows. And I love to see people live for the first time with Before the Dawn. And, I'm really excited about the, uh, the shows coming up. It's going to be awesome. Well, thank you guys so much. Everybody, we are here with Before the Dawn. Be sure to check out Stormbringers. This is Alex from Heavy New York, and we will see you next time. Yes.